Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to um, call the Town Council Finance Committee meeting to order at 2.35 p.m. and it is November 5th, 2019. Um, of the committee, um, there are two members who are not here. Shalini walked in. Shalini's here. Um, so the only one, Dorothy Pam is not here and um, she is planning to be here, but um, is going to be a few minutes late. And the one who we do not expect to be here is one of the resident members of the committee, uh, Mary Lou Talman. Um, but we do have a quorum present and we are proceeding. And um, so I want to thank everyone for being here. And I want to thank Amherst Media for um, providing coverage for the community. Um, the one item that we wanted to take up first you know, is um, the second item on the agenda. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, or propose to do, but uh, make sure that we all have agreement on this, is to um, reverse the two first items. So that number two comes first, the proposed affordable housing priorities policy, and then the second is the FY19 fourth quarter and year end budget updates. So we would try and cover those two first and maybe we would, um, that will allow Shalini to be present for those two items. Um, the percent for arts bylaw is just a preliminary report. It is not actually gonna be a final discussion of the item so that I can put that off. Um, the scheduling for 2020, I think, is just going to be a brief discussion um, so that uh, we can take that up later. And um, then the um, uh, one additional item is uh, to get a report on where we are for the major capital investment listening sessions. And uh, um, so we'll take that up. So the first two items, if that's agreeable to everybody, is to start with um, the affordable housing policy. I, was, I want to thank John Hornick, who's chair of the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust and who that sent the policy for consideration. Um, and then it was referred to this committee. Um, and uh, so we're um, looking at it as is the uh, Community Resources Committee. And uh, at the last meeting, uh, we had a brief discussion and sort of tried to identify issues that we thought we should pay attention to as we looked at the policy. Uh, as we agreed at the end of the meeting, I reduced that to a memorandum, uh, which is really just a listing of the issues and uh, uh, our vice chair, Kathy, um, looked at it and um, offered some comments and then we sent it along to the committee and it is posted. There's another item that is available that um, all of us either have electronically or in hand, which Mr. Hornick provided today and I will forward along to be included in the packet for today's meeting also, which is, um, some information that he provided after having um, seen our last meeting by Amherst Media. And uh, uh, that is uh, sort of a helpful launch to the discussion. So why don't you come on up and, so that, and then you're facing us and it makes, and browns the table, makes for a nice, uh, Approach and make sure your microphone is on. Um, so do you want to say anything introductory? Uh, yeah, I'll say something, given the opportunity. <laughs> uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, I appreciate it. I, first, I want to apologize for not being at the last meeting. That was a schedule mess up by myself. Um, but I did take advantage, as Andy said, of viewing the meeting on Amherst Media and also looking at the minutes or notes he provided. And I took those and frankly reorganized them in a way 
that I felt was easier to respond to. I did try to incorporate all of the elements that people had. Some were in the form of questions, some were in the form of comments, some were in the form of requests for data. And so I did what I could. And I hope this furthers the committee in its work. Um, I don't think I need to say anything more, um, except I'm prepared to respond to questions, uh, make additional comments. You know, the first obvious thing is I provided a table right at the top that seemed to be responsive to things that different people had asked for. What's happened in the last five years? What are the projects? and uh, uh, how many units, how many bedrooms, how many people, how much of town funds, how much of other funds. And as you can see, I couldn't complete that matrix uh, because the data isn't available. Nonetheless, I created it and left it here on the chance that at some point we can fill in some of the additional stuff so that we don't lose track of the fact that people had these questions. I should say, I have not reviewed this with Nate Malloy, which I should have done if I'd had time. I'm sure Nate can fill in some things that I missed. That was actually going to be my one question, was whether you'd had a chance to talk to Nate, since I assume you have his memo that he sent to us. And yes, and I used that in part, um, but there are a couple of things that weren't on that. You know, particularly, I created a proposed growth table, um, which uh, I thought you'd also be interested in, the, you know, as well as the growth over the last five years. Also, I should say that when I looked at his memo, there were a number of things that had to do with rehab projects, which I did not include in the top table because they were really maintaining the quality of existing units, not development of new units. Which makes sense. Um, yes, Kathy. No, I'd actually, thank you, John, for doing this extra work in the graph. I'd actually thought it would be important for the town to gather up this data. And I, I noticed last night on his slide, Paul talked about having spent $8 million in the last five years. But I, I just, you know, whatever the number is, I don't know right. what the yeah. right number is, but I think it would be good to both put how many affordable units we've been able to create and however we're counting them, whether they're single bedroom studios or two bedroom, and then how much total housing has grown. Um, because you know, if we get to the point as a town that we have a policy with a target, um, you know, one of the discussions at last night's uh, housing forum in the small group I was in, you know, if we only grew by a total of 250 units total in five years, having all of them be affordable, you know, just to, to put it in context of how fast are we growing with anything in town? And, and there was a lot of discussion of are there, have there been, will there be opportunities going forward? So I, I really appreciate you doing this, but I didn't think it should be you alone. I thought you know we should go back into the town records and and what they know about you know development around the town on new developments that are in process that may have no affordable units in it, but just uh, you know a general sense. So I do you know combining yours and Nate's, but just getting something out of the planning department that gives it's us a not so much combining as my drawing from information that he's provided in the past. Sure. Um, I'll just say that. Um, the official counts are things that the town provides to the Commonwealth subsidized housing inventory. And I provided the link if you're curious, so you can look and see what that is. I think it was established under 40B. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah, because, I believe so. Right. Um, so the town provides both counts of total housing as well as affordable housing or subsidized housing under that. And Nate will know all of that, so that can be added, I think, without too much difficulty. Uh, obviously, some of the items aren't quite so easy. Lynn? Um, you know, the, in this chart, my guess is that part of the way that the town manager got to the $8 million is he 
uh, included some value for East Street School. Yes, but that, my recollection is people estimated that to be a quarter of a million dollars or less uh, of the value of that property. I think the other big thing was, um, I think he included Rolling Green. And he acknowledged last night is that Rolling Green was an effort to preserve affordable housing that otherwise would have been lost if it had gone to market rate. It had been sold as a market rate development. And um, the town investment was very substantial. Um, we would have gone backwards yes. by that number of units had the town not partnered with Beacon to create the current ownership structure which preserves preserve the affordable units. Yeah. And it is on the list that Nate gave you. I didn't add it here because I considered it to be more than five years ago, um, although we're still paying off the bonds. I think it was the total of 1.25 million. Well, this sort of gets to a question that I have, and then I've, I keep looking around so that, because if any of you have questions uh, at any time, just signal to me so I know. Um, when the trust talked about the policy that it wanted um, the council to consider, and it talked about 250 units, um, it adopted a number that was already in existence from a prior policy, the housing production plan from, what was it, 14, 2014. There have been units constructed since. I'm assuming from what I heard last night, but I just want to confirm, that your proposal is essentially a start over of the 250, that you're not going backwards to 2014, you're going forwards from where we are now in your proposal. Yeah, I'm not suggesting, or we're not suggesting that we make up for lost ground. So the, I think that the um, value of looking at this information um, is that uh, it gives us an idea of how, what's the ratio of town funds to units produced in various projects because obviously we're a finance committee and our comments are gonna uh, be along lines in part, if not totally, it's a committee decision in the end, can we afford it? And uh, that historic data is in some ways um, a valuable predictor of what we can expect the cost to be going forward. Yeah, I hope they're a little less actually, Andy. Uh, well, I won't say we overpaid for some of these projects in terms of the town contribution. Um, one of the things that is in the policy is a statement that except under extraordinary circumstances, the range per unit should be, I think, between 40,000 and 100,000. And obviously we had had a number of projects that go over that. Uh, we don't say in the policy what are the circumstances under which you could exceed that. Uh, maybe we, sh we, we ought to have included that, but we didn't. Uh, I do think that there are, uh, I won't say the town overpaid, but it, it, I think the, there was more money there maybe than, than we should have put into some of these projects. Yeah, the, um, some of the small new construction um, ones, particularly the ones that were done through Habitat. Right. Now that is leveraged. I know it doesn't show there, but Habitat does leverage through sweat equity put in by the eventual homeowner, but also through contributions from uh, various building suppliers in town. Uh, and, and obviously other contributions that they received. But that leaves us with the other funds piece being blank, which is something that Kathy was referring to. I don't know if you want to 
Yeah, I, I mean, I realize it's a complicated thing to put together, but it, it you know, if we spend 700,000 and leverage another 5 million, you know, just, it, it's just some accounting way. Um, I did a rough adding up of the units that you have, and it comes to about 100, maybe a plus or minus, you know, and, you know, what did we spend directly? And I would include land value, whatever it is. Um, yeah, that's in the town funds column. And that's the town fund column. And then to the extent we were leveraging other, and that's it's clear that when a developer puts in units and we didn't have to spend money for it, that that was a good deal. So I did, it just all helps to get a context that if we spent this amount of money over five years and got 90 or whatever number, you know, um, what's doable over another, the next five years with what resources, what indirect, direct. So I think of a policy as being, you know, the target emerges sort of as a bottom line and a, a goal, but then it's here's the background information, here's how we think we might be able to get there, you know, what, what tools are we using to get there. So you've got a lot of the pieces of it, but some are missing. Um, and then we would have to decide whether, given our resources, that's, you know, how do we set that? Yeah. I, I agree, some of the information's missing. Frankly, what's missing is also somewhat complicated. For example, if you look at North Square, it looks like we're paying roughly $100,000 per unit. Um, but one of the things that the town got with North Square, Square is deeper affordability. So it's not 80% AMI, uh, and I'm not gonna remember the numbers, but I think it's as deep as 50% and maybe a few units at 30% AMI. So that's the reason the subsidy there would appear greater than it is elsewhere. So when you're looking at what we're subsidizing, it's not just units, but it's the affordability of units, which makes it more complicated. So is there anything further on the first part, which is the um, look at investments that have been made I'll say one other thing about this. Some More than a decade ago, I was involved in a study of mental health residential programs. And one of the things we were looking at is the cost per uh, bed or per unit. And the study involved half a dozen different states. And if you looked across the states, what you saw was a great variability. Massachusetts had a much higher cost rate, for example, than Tennessee. Well, why is that? Well, the answer goes back partly to what it actually costs to create a mental health resi residential unit, but e perhaps even more significantly, what states were willing to pay for. So when you look at this, the question isn't not so much what our costs might be going forward, Kathy, but what we're willing to pay for. And the more we're willing to pay, the deeper subsidies we can afford, the less we're willing to pay, the smaller number of units, or the less deep the subsidies are that would be available. I think that's important to think about, um, and not necessarily to place an over-reliance on history. Well, over-reliance on history has a problem, and I see you hand it, Bob. Um, over-reliance on history, in part, is that uh, we know that cost of construction goes up four to seven percent every year, and uh, another issue. So that there is that limitation on what you can use historical data for, Bob. Yeah, I just have a question about the the town funds. I mean, in, in some cases, are we not creating a tax subsidy? In which case, that would continue on into the future for some period of time. Do we have any handle on what that amount is? Um, as far as I know, there's only been one tax incentive financing project, which is the Beacon Communities project at North Square, which the actual value is estimated to be between, I believe, 2.6 and 2.8 million. Is that right? Okay. That's what I recall hearing. 
and I put in two point six million as the value. So yes, that's one of the ways we can of financing. The others are also, in essence, based on uh, local taxes. Well, not entirely local taxes. If we use community development block grant dollars, that's passed through money. Right, but so this 2.6 million then it's over a period of years, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to you know, make it clear that you may not have spent $2.6 million in, you know, over in this year or next year, that it's going to extend for 10 years, 15 years, whatever the period to further clarify, was that CPA money? Uh, no, that was tax incentive financing. Oh, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. There was a reduction in property tax. Got it. Um, but it is still expenditure of funds, whether you yes. take it by reducing income or you take it out of expen the expense side of the budget, it's still town funds. Um, Dorothy, welcome. What we're doing is we uh, flip the order on the agenda a little bit, and we are uh, started with the housing. Um, and what um, you're receiving is uh, John had done um, some attempt to respond to some of the issues that were raised at our last meeting that he was unable to attend um, in person, but attended by Amherst Media. and. Uh, so he provided that. Do we want to move on to the next section? Um, is there anything else to say here? Because we want to keep moving, knowing we have limited time. Um, the one thing I wanted to say about inclusionary zoning, which is the sort of the um, first topic, is mandatory inclusionary zoning. Um, since the last meeting, and I will send this to the entire committee um, after the meeting is over, I only came across it this, within the past few days. Um, I was advised by a former member of the uh, planning board that in 2014, the same group that did the housing study and the um, housing production plan, RKG Associates, um, did a study of what the cost, what, what the effect might be on construction of housing if there was a 15% requirement for um, inclusionary zoning in all projects um, as opposed to the way that the um, zoning bylaw is currently written. And um, the study was done for the benefit of the zoning subcommittee and the planning board because they were considering um, a proposal at town meeting and then recommended against it and it did not go forward to town meeting. Um, what their conclusion was, I can, um, I'll summarize uh, very simply, but it really is worth looking at because it really goes into great detail looking at the economic costs of constructing buildings and of development was that um, it is, they concluded at that time, again, remember the date, that it is highly unlikely that new construction would occur if there was a requirement of inclusionary zoning for all properties. and. Uh, the, um, and the, it was particularly true in downtown because cost of land is higher, so that the higher the cost of land, the more likely it is that you would have that net result. As a result, the um, then zoning subcommittee did not recommend um, this provision, which was actually, I believe, in the original housing plan is a suggestion to consider. Um, Definitely in the housing production plan. It was in the housing production plan, which actually was also, I believe, earlier in 2014. I think that's why they, it came up in 2014 to the um, planning board. Um, now, I did um, 
have some conversations with some of our staff in planning about that study, and uh, they, um, the, the feeling was is it probably needs some revisiting to see if there have been changes in some of the economic assumptions that were built into that study um, that alter the um, bottom line outcome of the study, but that it was very clear that that was the conclusion. Um, they also had um, some assistance from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to do some additional work that in PVPC came in with the same conclusion. Um, and uh, so we don't, it, it is something that needs to be considered carefully because as a finance committee, we have to recognize that not only does it mean that you not only get no affordable units, if that's still true, but you get no units at all and you don't get any new tax revenue from new growth. So the, it does have a financial impact if it, but we, um, I'm not sure that we know that the 2014 study is still valid unless somebody who has the appropriate expertise goes back into it. That was my recollection. And um, since I just came across it, I did send it to Shalini and I think in a couple others, but I will get it to the entire committee after today's meeting. Um, and I understand from Chris Brestrup, who I did discuss it with uh, yesterday, that Chris is getting it to the planning board, the 2014 report from Mark AG, and uh, so that they will be having a similar discussion. And I sent it along to the chair of the uh, Community Resources Committee. Um, Could I add something to that, Andy? Yes. I think it's worth noting um, as you follow that line of thinking, um, if there's no more, uh, or if um, construction downtown is um, viewed as not um, viable, if there is mandatory inclusionary zoning, then the, I think it's worth noting the economic impact on the downtown itself um, of that. Yes. Well, I have, and I'm not the one to do this, but <clears throat> I um, have heard that it operates in other towns, so it would be interesting to see an economic analysis of why it seems to be working in some other towns and not here. And then I would like um, some creative thinking on ways in which the town could make it so that it does work. Um, I like the idea of diversity so that instead of having all of the affordable housing together but having a small amount everywhere I think it makes a better town and there may be I think we've talked about um, offsets that perhaps may be um, a height inclusion or some kind of offsets which would allow the people the the developer to make what is regarded um, as a good enough profit for them to want to do the thing um, to happen, but to, in order to do it. So I'm, I'm just, I just feel there is some way to make this work, and I think we should do it, uh, because it's, it's, even if it costs the town something to make this happen, um, it would be, I think, better. Um, some of the towns where it has worked have an extremely different economic picture than exists here, and, uh, you know, everybody loves to pick on, to say, oh, but Cambridge does it. Cambridge is just not an analogous community whatsoever. The amount of commercial development that they have is just so overwhelming in comparison to ours that there's no way to draw that comparison. That's always everybody's favorite community. There are other communities that have made it work, so I think that, um, but I don't know where they are and what and how their similarities exist to ours. Each community is unique. Um, I think that it gets back to a point that Bob had brought up as I read the report, but everybody should read it for themselves because I may be misinterpreting it. And that was Bob's point from the last meeting that 
there isn't that much developable land and um, the expense of the land is so great that um, it is the factor that um, was driving that analysis. Um, but it, it clearly is from that report that it was more pronounced in downtown than it was in the other two locations. They actually did a deep analysis of three locations, one downtown and two others. So the question is, could, could it have worked, say, on Southeast Street? Don't know. Uh, would it work now on Southeast Street? Don't know. You know, there's uh, a lot, uh, but clearly the downtown and that report was where it was least usable. And I only point that out because everybody loves to pick on the three new buildings in downtown that have been built and the one that's under construction and saying, gee, if we had had affordable units in those buildings, how many affordable units we, could, would, we would have and the, the flip side of the question is, would we have any units whatsoever? Yeah, I just say generally with respect to this section, there is nothing that is listed here that was included in the town policy. Most of these items are really the province of the planning board, and so we kind of left it to the planning board to decide what, if anything, might be incorporated into the town policy, and in fact, they are um, working on that issue. Um, we have had uh, uh, one building built, 70 University Drive, with affordable units, and my understanding is the uh, two actually that would come presidential, on nine, also presidential, yeah. right? Oh, presidential added units, right? Uh, but I'm thinking about, I think it's Aspen Heights is the name, I can't remember if that's quite right, uh, would be built with affordable units. And I think it's now somewhere in the permitting stage. Um, no, I think that it gets back to Dorothy's point that um, it, uh, an inclusionary zoning would would spread it around so that um, if you had inclusionary zoning for some districts but not all, uh, that is something else that could be considered because, uh, you know, just the logical extension of this, I don't have to go any further. Are there other thoughts that people have going to what John has written on the top of page Two, there, he has a section of other possible approaches and strategies, and then a second one, which is eight things your town can do to add more housing without spending a dime. So I was wondering if there are other questions or comments about any of those sections. I don't really have questions on them as much as if we, if you thought through a package that had these possible levers in them, um, you know, speculation on how many of what could you get <laughs> uh, would be interesting. You know, even last night there was some talk about uh, some of the people who might have a unit in their own home that they could rent out are finding it uh, more economically advantageous to rent it out as a, a bed and breakfast, as a Airbnb. <laughs> you know, so you know people are going to make decisions with their own property. Um, so, to the extent, to the extent there's some consulting assistance, how could you subdivide your house if you wanted to do that to make a separate unit? You know, where are there barriers? to what could be a natural incentive to an older person living alone in a very large house that they might like company, you know, but when and where. So I think just some of this, trying to put a little bit more meat on it, and I'm not talking just about you, you, but trying to think of, you know, what is the barrier to that happening now? There was nothing to stop us from doing it in our big house, you know, other than, 
you know, would, you know, there's no separate staircase kind of thing. But, but you know, so some of these seem like, oh, that's a really good idea, but so it, it's thinking through that a little bit. And, and the study Andy's talking about, you know, that clearly if an area is zoned in a way that you can only build this tall with this many units on it, you're less likely to get multiple units there unless you think you can get someone saying you could do something differently. Um, and we've had examples with the up in North Amherst of co-housing coming in and figuring out a new way of using land where they are all very close together, but they share green space. Um, and making that easier or more difficult, you know, gets you housing. It doesn't necessarily get you affordable housing. It's the point we made last week um, that land is expensive in Amherst, and then building on expensive land is expensive. So even if you build a small house, it may not be a cheap small house. You know, so I just think getting a little bit of perspective on the things that don't cost anything would be great um, on thinking it through. You know, so we, do we have it now? What else could we do? And then the other thing I heard last night, and I don't have a sense of how much more and around the margin, <coughs> that when people get a Section 8 voucher to help them with their rent, the Section 8 voucher doesn't help you pay first month's month, last month's rent, and security deposit. So you can pay your monthly rent with the voucher, but you can't get you can't go to rent, you know, the contract. So that's around the edge of getting someone into the unit in the first place. And that's, Section 8's not under control, but around the margin of Section 8 could be CPA money or, you know, the community block grant. You know, just some of these are a smaller amount of money is not actually buying the unit, but it's buying them someone in to being able to use their voucher. So these are, are things that I don't have any sense of, does that get you 15 more in Amherst? Does that get you one more in Amherst? You know, just a sense of that has a lot of potential payoff, or this has very little again, around some of these um, possible tools that aren't, you know, paying a large amount of money, but paying some money or uh, giving some support systems. Yeah, the problem with Section 8 that you're describing occurs when someone has a voucher and wants to use it in a market rate unit, then all those other costs come into play. But if they want to use it in a unit that's designated as affordable, you don't run into those obstacles, which is one of the reasons for trying to expand the number of affordable units in town. I'm going to say, with respect to all of these things, I was trying to be responsive to the committee's interest in what other strategies might be pursued and the uh, uh, things the town can do without cost was something actually that Shalini provided that were in Andy's notes. Uh, so I thought, well, why not list them here? They overlap to some extent with ideas that Janet McGowan has. Uh, I don't think we can do all of these. And I guess I was thinking that the planning board would be sorting through these and deciding which ones were ones to make a priority at least. Uh, and the policy document itself might say, okay, the town's gonna try to move forward with two or three of these, but certainly not leave it entirely up in the air or say anything is possible. I think each of these is interesting in its own right, but they all have their own risks. It is. Um, there's one other section that I, we're going to run out of time, and there's one other section that I wanted to at least address myself, but I want to see if there are other sections that the rest of you want to make sure that you cover out of this memo and the amount of time we have left. Because I do, now that I know that Sean is here, um, we want to have, we have to build some time in for looking at the revised version of the tool if uh, he has that available, which was, and plus looks like he doesn't want to stay longer than necessary. <laughs> uh, the one that I wanted to bring up, I'm just, since nobody's raised their hand, is on top of page three, other 
uh, town financing rules, section five. We know we've talked extensively last time about CPA funding. Surplus town property, uh, we always have to be very cautious in thinking about the question of whether the property has resale value and what is the resale value that we're giving up by not using it. Um, this is my favorite topic of discussion is everybody wants to use the central fire station if we ever abandon it for the new fire station. Lynn has devoted her life to building. Um, and, uh, um, but yes, we could uh, make it into the Performing Arts Center that uh, the arts community talks about, um, but it also would be sellable for significant sums, it, everything you, you give away is an asset. So there's an asset value to the CDBG funds. I think we all know about tax incentive financing we already talked about. Airbnb, um, we can only do what the uh, legislature authorizes us to do and we've taxed it to the max. I thought the town had already adopted. Yes, we did. So there's, so we're already counting on that revenue into the revenue that we have. So it's not, there's not new revenue. Actually by statute, some of it has to be set aside for affordable housing. And the it's, town went with the state guideline, but not any yeah. further. And um, the inclusionary zoning payments in lieu, we have, you know, as you point out, it's there in the statute, we haven't collected any. Um, yes. I mentioned trade-offs where the um, zoning could grant the right to additional story for um, affordable units. There was no discussion of that. So why is that not a good idea? That in some ways is the inclusionary zoning provision that we have now. Change of use. Uh, no, the um, last town meeting changed the uh, bylaw so that any especially any permit especially no, used. That's, that's not what was said at, at the um, zoning subcommittee at the meeting. I was. At. That's not where the discussion has been. I don't that the original words the town meeting had was for any uh, permit, special permit, any permit. And the, it was, the words were added that said for change of use, and there was discussion, this is just within the last two weeks, that that should be changed and returned to any permit, all and any permit. I don't, it's in the minutes. I don't think that that's right, and I guess I'll have to discuss that with them because there was that action in the last town meeting. It was specifically done because, that, is that what your understanding is? Yes, you, but again, I don't recall the specific language. But yeah, I mean, in the case of uh, a couple of buildings downtown, uh, the issue was they got some special permit or waiver um, and the question was, well, should that have triggered the inclusionary zoning law, bylaw? The interpretation of the time was no, and so the bylaw was theoretically changed so that that wouldn't happen again. But I can't quote your chapter and verse either, yeah, Andy, no. so. No, I mean, obviously, uh, when he's Pleasant Street's the best example, it was uh, both height and setback, and neither one of them triggered because of the way it had been written before. Right. Right. I, I do yeah. have one other one, and it's really about the competition for CPA funds. And I'm actually quite concerned about this because um, based on what the goals are, whether how much of the CPA funds are we really looking to spend on housing versus the other three areas, which for other reasons are also important to the town. So um, I'm just as... Um, I was not in favor of going beyond the 50% required on the um, the Airbnb money. I'm very reluctant to say that a certain fund 
should have a certain percentage or have certain goals that must be met by that fund and it be captured by one of the four options for that fund. I actually should, uh, I owe it to Mary Lou who wrote this. Um, <clears throat> my priority for the housing policy would be for the homeless as the first group to be housed. Also, I would be concerned about the amount of financial backing the town would commit to the project from the operating budget and or grant money in light of all the other capital needs that are urgent. So I wanted to read her comment into the record at her request. Um, in, uh, actually, the first part of her comment, there was nothing in the policy that gave preference to homeless. It just was talking about affordable units, not to the population to um, benefit, as I recall your yeah, proposed policy. Yeah, that, that may be true. It may have been an oversight, but <coughs> certainly that was the intention. On the other hand, uh, the, the policy basically described wanting to have a mix of people uh, eligible at different rates of AMI although I think we settled on an average of 60% AMI, which means that you would have to have a fair number of units that were down around 30% in order to be able to get that mix. Um, but even 30% uh, is not necessarily going to be enough for people, for some people who are either homeless or uh, have extremely low incomes. Uh, Again, it's part of the discussion last night. Uh, Ginny Hamilton was saying that uh, her son has experiences with friends in school who come from families that are very poor and are forced to move uh, because their family can no longer uh, afford the rent and what they would need is a subsidy that assumed uh, a very low income or an extremely low income. So, I mean, all of these are values state questions. I mean, I, I'm not gonna say that I exactly disagree with what Lynn said earlier. I mean, obviously I do, uh, <laughs> but it's a values position. It's not a logical position. Like I can say, I'm right because of this. The answer is my judgment says that we ought to do a certain amount of affordable housing and unless we set ourselves to do that and actually work hard at making it happen, it's not going to happen. Yeah, Shelley. Yeah, I do feel like as a town council and taking into account what the values are of the town, we need to have a shared statement of you know, what are our goals with respect to whether of with the limited resources we have, was it, whether it is homeless people or and or workforce housing, that's another group that is sort of um, doesn't make it, make the cut. And so, I mean, if we try to do everything for everyone, maybe we don't have the resources. So could we, I mean, that's something we need to discuss, what are our goals for each of these populations and yeah, that's at least addressed or raised as a question under item six, concerns about affordability. What level of affordability do we want to pay for? Or what level of subsidy uh, are we willing to commit to? Yeah, Dorothy. I think that we should have people who receive um, welfare benefits or disability payments, either maybe it's like 15% of AMI, I don't. I think they should be included in our plan. Yes, I I agree, um, and I think somewhere we say that. Although, again, it, it may not be as specific as you would like it to be. In which case, yeah. that's why we're having this conversation. Okay. So I think that we. Um, I need to draw this to a conclusion, and it seems to me that there's several things. One is um, the. 
there seems to be generally within the committee a support for doing something, um, but that we have some big questions about what it is. Second of all, um, I'm not sure that um, how much of it is a finance committee discussion and how much of it is a CRC discussion, and it all will ultimately be a council discussion. Uh, but the, the development of some of the thinking on some of these issues um, probably falls more in CRC, and we ought to be at least making sure that while we don't have to be exclusive to our areas, that we cover the financial areas thoroughly. And in doing that, um, the discussion we had initially about costs, what we know are risks of, the, of making assumptions about costs per unit, um, available sources of funds, and um, negative financial consequences of some of the other strategies that have been suggested if we can identify that they exist or beneficial um, consequences if we can identify them they exist are probably the financial things that we should think about. Yeah. And um, I wonder if the best way to do it is to see if um, I can work with somebody else in the committee and try and come up with a little bit of an outline of that so that we can continue our discussion in a more focused way and see what kinds of resources we can get either from uh, finance or planning or whoever, whichever is the most important, appropriate department to help us develop any additional information that would be useful to, for the council when it comes back to them because that's what our goal is, is to be useful to the council and to inform their discussion. So uh, if that's okay, I think that what we could do is uh, I will work on that and maybe Kathy will be a good person to work with as uh, vice chair and see what we can do before our next meeting Yes, Bob. Andy, I just would like to add uh, effectiveness uh, to that list. I mean, how effective are each of these strategies? What do we get? Yep, you know, how easy it is to, to implement and, you know, what's going to work? A lot of these things could work or might work, but we don't know that they will work. That was, that was well said. That was my point, you know, that this gets you not much or gets you something, but with an awful lot of effort. <laughs> Right, and can I? Yes. Th that was a similar question I had. But, but the point was, can we look at the existing financial tools and see what has been effective? But and even if they haven't been, it feels like some of them we could find a solution. Why? Like for example, the tax incentive has not been utilized much, other than Beacon Community. So it seems like the flaw in this system is it's very complicated. So could we have a group that can consult or the legal paperwork, consult with the developers? So when we look at these tools, maybe there are easy solutions or easier solutions. So that would. Yeah, that's a complicated one. And I have to uh, say that, first of all, it's fairly new and Beacon is the only one that's come along, but there wasn't that much time. Um, and. Uh, you know, we had to go through the, the legislature to get permission to do it, and there are limitations in what the ordinance has provided and the legislative authorization has. Once Beacon came along with the proposal, um, it was a fair amount of work for Mr. Pooler, who was the finance director at the time that we put that through, to make sure that it got negotiated and structured in an appropriate way. It was not something that you can do very easily. There's a lot of work that goes into doing it, plus making the decision of the investment. Um, so yeah, we should encourage it um, as appropriate, but it's something that we have to recognize um, is not going to 
be easy to do, but that's not different from the others. And I think that that sort of gets to my last point, which I've brought up many, many times, and that is that um, as I've looked back over my history with this town and what we've accomplished, we've accomplished it because an opportunity arose and we grabbed the opportunity and there are all sorts of different opportunities to arise. But it's hard for us to create things. Um, sometimes it's a, it takes a partnership to create it and we don't know the partners are gonna be until they come out of the woodwork and come to us. So I think that the other question I would have for the uh, Affordable Housing Trust to think about and CRC to think about is how do we go about and create partnerships on our own? Is that possible? But that's not, it's a policy issue as much as a, maybe more than a financial. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I, I have a clipping, I wish I brought it with me, of a new development made by Wayfinders, um, which included lots of things that we would love and included uh, one that was also targeted towards, uh, I guess, single mothers who needed to go back to school and they actually had a room which was a set up as a school study space in this new development. This is something that just, I, got, I think we just got out of the paper recently, maybe, I don't know if it was the Boston paper or the Springfield paper, but you know, Wayfinders does, does great things and I thought, wow, they did that there. Couldn't we do something like that? Wayfinders is a great organization, and actually, I mean, I would encourage um, some direct conversation by an appropriate body, and it's probably not the Finance Committee with Wayfinders about, um, you know, I've worked with them for years. They used to be called HAP Inc., and back in the days when I first started working, with, they were called Housing Allowance Project, uh, and uh, they uh, are, certainly one of the most creative uh, organizations. I think that they uh, as much seize opportunities as the other way around. They were the, certainly our partners in Butternut Farm. Uh, and that was a question of, I believe the planning department identified the possibility and partnered with them. Uh, and, but they were there and ready to jump and ready to make it happen. Uh, but uh, we could, we sh somebody should really involve a conversation with them. The town staff are in touch with Wayfinders as are members of the Housing Trust. So it's, it's not that they're unknown to us. Um, but, okay, well, I think we need to go on, but thank you very much, John. You're welcome. Are there any other issues that I should attend to if I, you know, is it worth doing a revision of this document? What would you want in it if you had it? Um, I don't think I would encourage you to spend the time on it now, but um, as we identify things, the one thing that we need to do and we need to talk with Nate Malloy about is gets back to the chart at the beginning on uh, page one and uh, I know that Kathy uh, has talked about that because uh, I think that she would like to make that a lot more complete and richer chart. And um, I think that was one. And I am reading the CRC minutes. I haven't gone to their meeting. I mean, they have, uh, they've identified a series of things. So I think you trying to respond to things as two different committees ponder issues would be time consuming rather than waiting to get you know, a more s solid group of, uh, you know, either questions or ideas about where we think we could be going. And as you said, this, you know, finding to the extent to which the planning department can refine the table, add to it, expand it, whatever. Um, but you shouldn't have to do all of that, yeah. Well, town staff are pretty busy, and if I can, I try to pitch in. So, um, I think what we're gonna do, what I'm gonna propose that we do is, um, because I know that Shalini needs to go, or I don't know if you, need, you said, gave a time around now. Um, 
So um, the uh, two things that I want to make sure that we address today, and I want to get to Sean next and get his report on where we are with financial planning tools and anything that he has to report to us so that he can move, uh, get going. And then the other is the um, fourth quarter and year end report, which we have received. And I want to have some time today for those who are present, um, because I know that you won't be able to be here for that to have a preliminary discussion of questions, but there will be a second opportunity at our next meeting. It's not a report that goes away, and it is what it is, and it's what's important is we have the opportunity to understand it. So. Um, I'll just watch this on the, on the Amherst Media site. So okay, and then if you have additional questions, particularly on that last topic, um, that I mentioned, the fourth quarter year end report. Certainly, Sonia comes to all of our meetings so we can come back and uh, follow up at, at the next meeting with additional questions that you or Mary Lou might have, since Mary Lou also couldn't make it. Okay, so Sean. No, I said the good old trusty thumb drive. Hello, everybody. So the update will basically be bringing you through some of the changes that um, I've made since the last time we met. And it feels okay. like we're getting closer to the final version, but you can let me know if there's things that you see that still need some tweaks. Yeah, I'm gonna bring up the cost of doing nothing. So um, what we're talking about now is the financial planning tool. It has been worked on, I think it was last time was version 1.03. Um, and uh, it is to help uh, this committee, the council, and the community to understand the costs of the uh, projects that uh, we've been talking about, the major projects the elementary schools, libraries, the um, fire station, the DPW facility, and um, to help um, facilitate a community conversation uh, about them. This looks a little funny. Yeah. Is this working okay? that allows you to engage that computer? It's called Solstice. No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I have it, Kathy has it. Okay. If, we'll allow you to open up, the, open up the Excel workbook? Yeah. Yeah, it's something called Solstice that they had me download and then a code appeared on there and I could log in. It was kind of magical. It's really funny. I'm not getting mine to open. What? I'm not getting mine to open. Oh, yes, it is. If you want, I can try working on this while Sonia and Holly do the budget report if you want. Okay. Just to use task. That would be work. Um, Sonia, what we thought we'd do is in, uh, rather than uh, us watching Sean try and uh, 
get it started that we at least have the initial conversation about the uh, fourth quarter year-end report, which you did send to the committee in advance, and uh, I think that everybody had a, a copy. Um, so I'm just, here it is, mine. So I don't know if you have any introductory comments that you would like to make. I wanted to bring Holly here with me for this report since we kind of did this as a team effort this year, all the year-end stuff, and we both worked on the quarter report together. So she can <coughs> remind me of the things I forgot and I can do it vice versa for her. <laughs> I wanted her to present this today, but she declined. <laughs> so um, General Fund ended up with a um, operating surplus this year of almost $4.1 million. Are you there? Just, you, you can finish. Do you want me to continue or do you want yes. me to? Yes. Okay. Um, the, best, the best way to look at it is if you look on page eight of the, of the um, quarterly report, that's the best summary for this. And to what made this up is 75% of this was um, revenues in excess of what was budgeted. And the main, the main contributor to this was the $2 million being paid back from the Health Claims Trust Fund. Uh, 2018, we voted $2 million out of free cash to avoid having a deficit in our Health Claims Trust Fund. We were having issues that we've since gone to Maya to a fully insured plan. We instituted a surcharge, and it was going to take two years to pay this back. However, we received quite a bit back in large claims from our stop-loss policy, which allowed us to end this much sooner. So the $2 million has been paid back, and that's the biggest contributor to this. The um, second largest would be our um, Medicare D reimbursements. This is not a budgeted revenue, but the revenue comes into the general fund. We let it fall to free cash, and we subsequent, used to be a subsequent town meeting, but now a council vote will move that money from free cash to OPEB. And this is the last year that this is going to happen because we no longer have Medicare D. Uh, the third contributed to this was uh, tax liens that were collected in excess of what we budgeted. The other 25% contributing to this is returns from operating budget. Uh, the biggest contributors there were, I'm lost in my notes here, caught me off guard. Was the general fund, was the biggest part at $786,000. And that was um, savings on our benefits, savings from bidding out our property and casualty insurance. Overall, we saved over $100,000 on that. Uh, it was, it's allocated through region, elementary school, library, but the biggest chunk of it was, was here. Yes, in the enterprise funds, thank you. The other was uh, largest was community services, and that was, money being returned, the, the $60,000 that was voted at town meeting for social services, which was for, um, what was it? Youth. Preschool? Youth. Youth. Uh, we didn't have time to get into a contract, so the money had to be returned, because we can't carry over money to spend after, unless we had a contract in place, and we didn't, so it would close back to free cash. It's, it's all in this report. It's all written up in the, in the previous pages of what it, what it is. And if you look on pages five through seven, there's more detail from each account where the money came from. So I didn't want to read everything line for line. I just wanted to give you a quick overview on that. So that's, that's it for the general fund. Good news. We also have free cash certified and uh, we certified at 6.1 million. Again, that is because we brought back 2 million into the general fund from the Health Claims Trust Fund. That's why it's so high. And 
it's been our financial policies to move anything that is over 5% from free cash, 5% of an operating budget from free cash and move it into stabilization fund. And I believe we're planning on doing that again this year. The enterprise funds. Get there. If you look on page four, it's pretty much summarizes the enterprise funds. We had, we had revenue deficits in um, water and sewer. The um, rates, consumption was way down this year. We had a lot more rain, so there was a lot less use. And, um, but there was enough turn back in water to, to cover, to create a surplus of 137 sewer. There was not, so we had a deficit there. And we don't have to raise that. We have sufficient retained earnings to cover that. So it's not, it just reduced our free cash and sewer for that. And everything else is pretty normal. Anybody have any specific questions on this report? I, I didn't quite catch. Did you say that the uh, excess four million is gonna go into the stabilization fund? A no, the it's something about stabilization fund. I didn't quite catch one, Our free cash was certified at $6.1 million this year. So anything over 5% of the operating revenue for that year, is our, it's been our policy to move that from free cash to stabilization fund. Because free cash goes away June 30th. It has to be recertified every year where stabilization fund is constant and it's always available. It's all money that's available to us. It just comes in different forms. It's like two different forms of savings accounts, essentially. Right. Yeah. Um, I was trying to get the numbers to add up, and uh, because we had um, four million eighty-one thousand three eighty-nine was the amount of um, going excess uh, surplus, net surplus, and then. Two million was the amount that we had um, allocated from free cash to the health claims trust fund that comes back. So that's roughly half of it. Um, and then in the uh, we had said the remaining that one million seventeen thousand seven sixty five comes from department spending below budgeted levels, and the other portion is excess revenues, and that all adds up, I gather. Yes. Um, so when we compare against prior years, because you made that in the prior paragraph, if the comparable figure would be to take the 80, 45,987 and added to the 1 million, so that is one mil about 1,097,000, 1, 1,098. I guess I'm not following what you're calculating. I'm just trying to, comp um, in the first paragraph, mm -hmm. you had said, the 4,081 was much higher than prior years, and then you gave the FY18, 17, and 16 numbers. And I was trying to get the comparable figure if you backed out the 2 million and see how that worked out. See if that made the difference. If that made the difference. Well, if you back out the 2 million, you get down to 2 million, which is higher than the 1.5, 1.8, but it starts to be in the ballpark, right? When I look right. across the years. Yeah. yeah. You know, right. So if I just take that one out, that's a one-time phenomenon as we transitioned. Um, so we had roughly two million more. Two million, but also we, um, our surplus return for the general fund is higher than normal. Yep. So that's, that would make, make up the difference of the anomaly here. So, you know, going along where Andy was trying to track prior years to this year, and is it a practice, um, which I think is a good practice, that 
you're conservative both on the revenue side and the expenditure side. So it looks like you're, you're rarely coming in with an exact balance. You're coming in with, you know, for, for different reasons probably in each year. It's because some staffing turnover happened, something came in lower. Because if I go across the years, one six, and I tend to round up, so one seven, one nine, one six, you know, and then this year the bump up, you know, we're in, we're in the sort of same neighborhood. Um, is, is that what's going on here that you? We're very conservative in budgeting our revenues. Yeah. And um, our expenditures are tight every year. I mean, returning some of these departments, returning uh, public safety, returning 123,000 out of a what, $8 million budget. Schools? Schools? Oh, education returning zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, John. You can ask John that one. <laughs> but um, public safety returned 123,000 out of $10 million for public safety. That's, that's not a lot of money being returned. Their budgets are tight. All the budgets are. Sonia's call on the um, general government thousand. Um, that also includes one or two positions that went unfilled for the year. In general government? Yeah. Yeah, yes. It, it includes open positions that have not been filled, turnover, there's been a lot of turnover and it takes right. time to, to get people in place. And um, public, the 123 coming back from public safety, that, that too is turnover. It takes. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, the anomaly here is general government because of the health insurance, we increased our rates and then we went to to Meyer, we paid off our um, surcharge sooner, so we didn't have to use that appropriation that we had for um, the town side. So all of that played into the 786,000. It's all in the text in here. Yes. I'm on page four, and this is my stupid question of the afternoon. The sewer fund had a revenue deficit, Okay, of 371,691 and returned appropriations. So I do know that you subtract the returned appropriations from the deficit and you get the total deficit, but I don't understand what the returned appropriations mean if there was a deficit. So if you look on page nine, budget versus actual statement, that, that's the clearest. The top part is revenue sources. So. Our, our um, charges for services came in less by $483,000. But expenses, we didn't spend as much as we budgeted. So that's returned appropriations. So the 268,454, we didn't spend that. So the net of that would be the deficit in that fund. Because it's an enterprise fund, it, it's net. One of the things um, I think that would be helpful as we go into next year's budget, when we get to these enterprise funds, to get a fuller display of the reserves, you know, just because clearly some of the way that we're able to go year to year is we've built up reserves. So if revenues don't come in the way we thought we, we had, it's not uh, doing a mid-year rate increase on anything. And I, I know you have those, Sonia. I just, I'm just thinking that when we look at them, you know, we just talked about the new plant coming in and going backwards, but also forwards, knowing what we have in reserves, um, so we get a better sense of how this works out. Right. Um, I can tell you we have about 2.1 million, over 2.1 million in sewer for retained earnings. We have just over 2 million in water. 111,000 in solid waste and 173,000 in transportation, which are all certified. Right. So it gives us a buffer. Um, you know, you don't want to run a deficit for too long or the right. buffer goes away, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We watch that very carefully. Lynn. Um, Sonia, besides the, I, I think it was the youth programs was 60 million. I could be wrong. It could have been some other, but besides that, are there any other funds that were committed by town meeting that didn't get expended? Um, I don't believe so. Not this year. Thank you.
So I have a um, process question and one or two comments. The process question is, have you had a discussion with Paul about um, sending this report to the council, and do we or does it come to the council through a report from the finance committee? How are we handling that as a process? It's been a while since we talked about it. I've talked about it with Paul, but I believe it comes to the finance committee, and it's a report to the council. Okay. So to come from us, right? Which then gives us the ability to put a memo on top of it similar to what prior finance committees did um, in sending it to town meeting. Um, it would go to town, it, it, we did send it to town meeting at the um, fall special town meeting but with a finance committee um, memo on top. And I think that the one thing that we explained is that the amount that gets, and you have it a little bit in your memo too, the amount that gets added to reserves, the total of the two reserve accounts, um, is not necessarily the amount that shows as a surplus here for the reasons that you explained. Right. That it's not been audited and uh, it's, free cash it's not been audited, been but also, also this report is budgetary only. So this is reporting only on the budget that was voted for fiscal year 19. It doesn't include any carry forwards that we carried over the year before that didn't get spent. That all gets closed out to free cash, but that's a whole different other um, gap process that we work through with DOR. This is, this is telling you how the budget performed. And then what happens is that ultimately in free cash usually gets certified pretty much at the end of the year, calendar year, but yes. it's not tied to the calendar year. It gets, it usually gets certified. Once we would close our books and now we have to close the whole system, the whole financial system, the MUNA system here. And then once we do that and we've filed all our other reports, the free, the um, Schedule A, and our balance sheet is final. We send it in for free cash, and that usually happens right, ar right around October. Okay. Do we have any? <clears throat> excuse me. Do we have any other votes that the council has to make with regard to transfer of funds based on FY19? Yes. And when will those? We come? follow our finance policy and move anything over five percent from free cash into stabilization. Right. So there's a transfer there, and then our Medicare D money that closed out to free cash, we need to move that into OPEB because that's been our policy and our practice. And when do you see those uh, being ready to come forward? Um, I can make them ready just about any time. It's just timing of what. Should they come to the finance committee first, Andy? They yes. will. They yes, they should come to the Finance Committee first. Okay. And they, uh, the second of the two that was described can't come until the um, DOR certifies free cash. Right. That's fine. So we're probably not talking until the first of the year. Right. There's okay. no rush. Yeah. I'm, I'm just looking at two, yeah. um, a, two agendas for the council, one in December and one in, one in November. That are just so jammed that we'll be here till two. This can moment. wait beyond that. <laughs> well, now we have the advantage of what we called year-round government when we were talking about adopting a charter, because we used to rush it to try and get it around town into town meeting sessions. Right. We don't have to do that anymore. Right. We can do it at any time. Um, I don't know if that's the good Medicare D one has a, an additional factor that we probably should be reporting to the council and considering when we. Um, set of budget guidelines, and that is that um, we funded um, OPEB in essentially two ways, if I recall. One is the Medicare D, and the other is direct appropriation. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the Medicare D will no longer exist after this year for the, because we no longer are running our own health care trust fund so that we don't get the Medicare reimbursements don't come to the town anymore. Um, so that needs, we need to consider whether to recommend a greater OPEB so that we can continue the OPEB contributions in an amount, and I guess that we're looking for recommendation from the town manager on that. 
Um, but um, I know that was a mouthful, and I want to make sure that anybody understands what we're talking about with, OPE, uh, with the Medicare D and OPEB and how that worked. And there was one other piece to that, and that was, if my recollection was, is that we get the entire amount, and then we were giving some amount to uh, Pelham and to the region. And um, so if we're doing that again, that's another action that has to to come in a council order, I would think. They've already received their portions of it. Um, because it comes through and it's already identified as region money and Pelham money, we were able to just let them put the revenues into their side instead of falling for free cash. This is the last time we're gonna be doing this transfer, so we just expedited so that they would have their money now. Okay. With mass, um, within Muni Mod, Municipal Modernization Act. If we were continuing with our health claims trust funding, we were continuing with, with Medicare D, we could have gone and had one vote to declare all Medicare D money, OPEB money, and we wouldn't have to do any of these transfers anymore. But since this is only this was going to end, we didn't even bother to bring that. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Medicare D reimbursements come mostly to retirees who are participating in our health insurance plan as town retirees. And therefore, it seems most logical when we got the Medicare D reimbursements since, um, to, to put that into OPEB, and that's uh, what we were doing. Uh, the quickest explanation that I can give to that. Uh, the other uh, thing that was on my mind is that, um, and this gets back to all of you who are sitting there, one of the reasons that we'd always been trying to, um, over the past several years, um, build up our stabilization fund because we knew that the major building projects were coming. And the thought with the major building projects is that there might be some reason to uh, spend some money in the most likely time to do that. And Sean, when he shows us the graphs in a minute, will be able to demonstrate what I'm talking about, that in some years, if expenditures have to go over the, uh, that balloon, the 10% limit, yeah that that's where you could justify pulling money from the stabilization fund so that you can continue on with current uh, money that is going into ongoing capital expenditures as uh, recommended to the town manager by JCPC um, and not uh, and, and still be able to do the projects. So that when we go um, into the charts, Sean will be able to demonstrate that to us. And uh, that's an explanation that we may need to include in our report to the council so that the council understands why um, having that money is available. Do we, speaking of stabilization funds, do we have a percentage or some level of requirement for how much we have to maintain in stabilization funds at all times. We don't have we don't have a requirement for stabilization fund um, standing alone. We do have our reserves that between five and fifteen percent of our operating budget. Okay, thank you. Is and our the, policy? Yeah. And this was a this was a policy that the old finance committee had adopted. Um, and was modified from time to time by the um, former finance committee. It was one of their charges at the time to adopt um, a budget, essentially financial policies for the town. I think that we're in a different era and what's gonna happen is, is that the finance committee will recommend changes to it as changes become appropriate but it will require council action to change it. I think that uh, we don't have the same authority that we had 
in the prior form of government, but it's not something that we've. Yeah. Uh, this is, I don't want to spend our time with Sean this way, but the setting the goals and establishing the guidelines for both reserves and what they're used for and stabilization of what they're used for is something I think we need to spend a little time on with the council mm -hmm. and then looking at how we deal with that because it's come up now a couple times in discussions about the fact that we're dipping into stabilization funds or that kind of thing. I just want to point out that we're at 19.7% this year once we got the $2 million paid back. 19.7. Because of the fact that we had yeah. thought we spent a bunch to 16.5 million health claim trust fund alive, and then it turned out that we didn't. It wasn't needed. I feel like we're in very good financial shape. I just know that as we move into the capital projects, or should we unfortunately be hit with any serious fluctuations in state appropriations, these are the two like death knells. Yep. So I, I just want to make sure we all understand it and how to go forward. Thank yes, you. Yes, Paul laughs at me when I say I want 25%. Yeah. Um, so um, let's get to the other topic for a second. Sean is going to demonstrate how the chart shows us Thank you. what we're talking about as to where you might want to recommend use of stabilization to um, make the plan work and um, still be able to do the capital that right. needs to be done. So I'll send this to you all either this evening or tomorrow. Um, there's four changes I just want to highlight real quick and then we can model um, something. Um, the first change is I think last time we talked about adding more options for repair. Um, of the library. <laughs> Originally we just had 10 million and we talked about adding different tiers. Um, so those different tiers have been put in. I can't read that, but that's, thank you. It's up to you, yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's easy. Um, the other sort of visual change is uh, we put the ongoing capital on top as to not make it look like any project was on top. So just a small change, but you'll see that yellow bar now that represents ongoing capital is at the top. Um, and if somebody says, like, I don't want to be the project on the bottom, I'll probably lose it. So I'll just go put that up there. Um, but so that's done. Um, there is now sort of a first crack at an assumptions page. And so you'll want to look through this and see what you think. Um, so it's the original instructions. And then there's assumptions and some information about each of the different variables that are in there. Um, and where possible, I try to link it to information that's already on the town website. Um, and then the last one that's sort of a bigger change, but I think it, I don't know, you can let me know if you think it's better or worse. Um, so before, if you wanted to do the two school option, you sort of were locked in to doing two new schools or two renovated schools, and there wasn't really any choices around size of those schools, which makes it really difficult to really model that accurately. So what I put in there is the, there's an extra decision. Um, the first decision is whether you want to do the two school option or a single school option. And so you choose that. And then based on that, it brings you to the next decision, which allows you, if you choose the single school option, you choose from this list. If you choose the two school option, you can choose from this list. And it gives you ad renos and news at different enrollment sizes. Because um, I think that is an important piece to recognize that there's just going to be, there could be different enrollments depending on how that plays out. Um, and these are all tied to the final report from TSKP. They're sort of the, the midpoint of the different groupings of cost estimates that we received. And then from there, you can do the same stuff. Choose whether they're debt exclusion, what year you want to start it, how long. Um, so those are the, the four changes. So I'll model something real quick, and then we can talk about uh, the reserves as it relates to um, expenses exceeding the 10% levy. So we'll do the library project, existing capital. We'll do fire station at 20 million. We'll do that from existing capital. Do DPW 25. Can you, 
Can you tell us what you're doing? Yes, yes. I'll I be, literally can't see that. Sorry. Far. All right. So <laughs> the options, which I think I'll stick with for now, are for the library, just again, modeling, not proposing, modeling, um, addition, renovation, um, the, the MBLC project, essentially, the $35.6 million ad run out in year 2023, using existing capital funds and looking at 30 years. Fire station, 20 million, um, modeling 2024 with existing capital funds and 30 years. Department of, Pu Department of Public Works, 25 million, 2022 existing capital funds, 30 years. And then for the schools, a single school option at 80 million, um, 2023 with a debt exclusion. And again, just a model. Just so we can look at how it plays out. Um, borrowing rate using 4%, um, which is the midpoint of the options. Cost escalation using 4%, which is the midpoint. Um, using 7.5% for net zero, and doing the percent for art. And ongoing capital um, right now is at 2.5 million, which is roughly half, maybe a little less than what's currently spent on ongoing capital. So it's, it would be dropping down. And if you do that, and you look at the chart, so you'll see the three projects in there. Um, this is your existing debt as it runs off. This is your ongoing capital at the two and a half million. Here is the DPW in gray, the library in purple, and the fire in red. And the number kind of focus on is this 12 million. And so I've been sort of operating if it's around 10 million or less that it's um, given our discussions around reserves and, and other, you know, some parts of the model that are conservative, um, that it's probably a plan that could be at least explored further. Um, so this is close to that. And so, you know, there's different ways to incorporate the reserves the town has to help with this model, um, but the years where you might need to think about it um, or, or how you might factor that in would be these years where the, it, you know, eclipses the 10% levy line. Um, so this 12 million is not in any one year, it's the cumulative of all these years. So the biggest single year would be about 2 million um, and it would get smaller after that. This is the total debt. And then the other thing that's in here is the um, debt exclusion. So this is modeling based on 322,000, which I believe is around the median household income in Amherst. And so there's only one debt exclusion in this model. So it just goes up once and then sort of winds its way down, and this was the percent for art thing that we put in as well, around the debt exclusion. If, if you went back to the model mm -hmm. and you said we were going to spend four million on, ca on other capital instead of 2.5, could you show us what that? Makes a, yeah, that, that variable makes a big difference in the model. And just, again, to reiterate the assumption, so it's, it's 4 million in the base year, which is 2020 or 2021. Um, and then it scales up based on the 2.5% estimate of the levy going up as well. So that's why it grows a little bit in the future. What year do you have the last project starting in whatever I'm looking at? It? Starting um, 2024. So okay. this is being aggressive and you know trying to do all the projects really within sort Can of five years. Can you just year. give us a sense if you take two of them? I don't care which two. Stretch take. them out. You have what? to take DPW and then fire. Take yeah. DPW and fire and put them in what, 2028, 2030, you know, just something further out, um, stretch the timeline out on when they start? And uh, take Lynn's and go back to either 2.5 million or 3.5 million, or, you know, just something a little bit smaller. No, in the past, what I saw is it doesn't help us very much, and I just wanted no. people to see it doesn't the, help very this, much. This piece makes a big, so this really makes the biggest difference, or one of the biggest differences is how much you, um, just going from 4 million down to 3.5 made a pretty big 
um, impact on this number. It went from about 55 down to 36. Yeah. The other thing that's... Um, again, it's looking at all time. And again, other parts of this model, again, why I say it's conservative is like, so we're assuming the 2.5% going forward. We don't, we're not factoring in new growth beyond that, which over the long term is probably a safe assumption to try to keep it conservative. Um, so, you know, in any given year, things could be a little bit better, a little bit worse. Um, but the amount of funds we dedicate to ongoing capital is one of the variables that makes a big um, Im impact on the chart. Um, can, and the other, uh, other issue is the longer we go out, two things. The more we have to deal with the price going up just because of inflation, mm -hmm. but the less sure we are that we'll be able to be at 4% interest rate. Yep. And that's the piece that scares me. Yeah, the farther out you go, the, again, the projects get more expensive because of the cost escalation assumptions in here. And the, you're right, the interest rate is farther out, the more you'd probably lean towards the 5% number. Yep. And, yep. Go on. The amount that you're um, allocating to capital, a top bar, that's increasing each year by two and a half percent. Yep. Yeah. So it's so the first the, the number you're putting in. Yeah. So is when you, the first year exactly. So if you look in a year like this, in the behind the you know the chart behind it, it's going to be more than in this case three and a half million because it will have grown over that time. So it does allow again. It does allow for that in the future. It's not like we're holding ourselves at three and a half million forever. Um, it's just those increases are going to be small each year. That um, that goes towards ongoing capital. But it mirrors what we do generally because um, it's tied it, to the tax levy. You know, as it, as assuming it, yeah. we got to ten percent and we figured out what ten percent is, that's the amount the tax levy is going to go up mm -hmm. in a year. I think the thing that's confusing is you don't see the schools here because it doesn't have to be in our debt exclusion. Right, yeah. If I but it does go into the tax rate. Right. Yep. Did we discuss whether there was any way to do a few different uh, scenarios for, you know, your home is priced at this price or your home is priced at that price? Yeah, yeah no, that's, yeah, that's, you can definitely, um, so this is, allows you to enter it yourself, but we can put some, um, I think you you had already made that change. You can plug in any value, yeah. any number so that any number you want in that. But again, we could create a, for some people they may not want to go into this. We could create a chart that kind of gives those approximate numbers. Yeah. But the default setting right now is the median. Mm -hmm. I have just a, a couple questions on choices you've made. The choice to put um, the ongoing capital on top rather than the bottom. What was? No, just what was yeah. the reasoning? Um, I think at the, the time it was whatever project was on the tippy top kind of felt like it was what was pushing us over the limit. And so it, so was, maybe the bad it, it was the bad guy or bad woman? Yeah, <laughs> maybe perception, a perception problem as opposed to... Right. I personally preferred the old way, <laughs> but I understand the sensitivity. Yeah. The old way you can see sort of the ongoing capital kind of mirror the trend of the 10% levy well, line a little I think easier. So there's an, yeah, there's an advantage to it, and that is that we all know that ongoing capital is something that we've been committed to, and that's where um, things that people understand, like roads and sidewalks, uh, keeping buildings maintained, uh, replacing equipment that wears out, everything you do is a normal course of business. and. Um, if you don't do something and you keep, and you just borrow a bunch of money for other projects, that's ultimately going to be what's squeezed unless you take it out of um, free stabilization. Um, I think that's right, but you know I agree with Lynn. I liked I liked it the old way, but I can understand why you flipped it. And I'm wondering very if, easy change. So whatever. no, no, no. I'm wondering if one thing we might do um, when it, including when it comes to the full council. Um, freeze frame a slide with no choices on it where we haven't done anything on the four buildings mm -hmm. and let you play with that. So you can just see that we only have so much money and if, you know, I want to spend it all on roads or what, you know, and then you can, that would just be the 
buying off old debt mm -hmm. and yellow so that people have that picture in their mind on how much room there is under the line right. before we start building it up. Um, yeah, I, don't know. I, I have said this more than once, but I'll say it again. I also don't mind if you want to put DPW in fire. Put fire on top. Go ahead. Put fire on top. I don't care. Yeah, because I think the sensitivity was library kept getting on top, right? Yeah. yeah. It's from the library. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, DPW has its own issues in that people, whenever they need it, they need it. Whenever it doesn't do right, they complain. And whenever they don't need it, they can't tell you what they do. So, uh, but fire and EMS, we know what they do. And I am put it on top. Yeah. So the only thing I, need to, I would need to do, which is, again, very easy change is just add a zero option for the cost. I, right now we kind of left this so you had a model, all four projects. Um, but if I add a zero option, then you could um, not, you could pick. Lynn, Actually, this, this gets to the other point I was going to raise. Um, I don't think I'd want a zero option. And the reason is mm -hmm. that uh, Lynn and I have had this discussion several times, and that is there's a cost of doing nothing, and the cost of doing nothing is built into the library how much they concluded needed to be spent that they have not asked to incorporate into prior C, um, bud, JCPC budgets because they were counting on this happening. So they put in an amount and gave you an amount which is I call the cost of doing of not doing a project is that you have to do something to just maintain the building. Right. So putting it as zero is not realistic for yeah. any of these buildings. The problem is is we haven't calculated it for the other ones, and uh, I somewhat uh, feeling that we're not treating all projects equally within the model if we've created this option for one and not for the other three. So in the <coughs> work that I've been doing to try to get a set of draft slides ready for us to go on the road, um, I actually have gone back through the old studies, first of the fire station, which goes all the way back to 2006. And this is where I, I, I hate these numbers. I don't think they're reliable. But in fact, we have a number for what it would cost to repair Central Fire Station or, or at renovate Central Fire Station. The problem is it's a 2006 and then a 2009 number, and the multiplier is close to 6%. I don't understand that level of inflation um, annually. And then DPW actually do have a figure in the feasibility study that was done in 2016. And the, of what it would cost to renovate the existing DPW. So um, I'm still working on those. Andy and I are going to spend a little more time looking at that. Anytime you'd like to give us, both of you, in doing this, all three of you, is most welcome um, because um, it's hard to take a figure out of a study that's over 10 years old and place any reliability on it. Yeah. And I think for the schools, we could go back through the JCPC report from last year and yeah. go to all of the out years. Yeah, we've and got a pretty good. We've got a decent number for the schools, and one of the things Sonia and I um, were going to do for this JCPC cycle was for all the departments have them include the projects that maybe were previously not included, but help us come up with those numbers for you all. So for the schools, what are the projects that, if the new buildings were built at a certain point or the new building was built at a certain point, what kind of would come off the capital plan and have the same analysis for each of the projects so we can give you a rough estimate for all, all four uh, building projects. So I'm not trying, I want to go back to the, your statement on the schools. I actually think we have a better estimate for the schools by looking at the Fort River study. Yep. Because the Fort River study includes a full renovation option yeah. in it, what it and, and that is without zero energy right. having to be put on it. The only question I have is, could you actually extrapolate that number to be a 600 student school? Are you going to just be bound by it being, I think it was 460 or something, was the highest enrollment that they went in any of those schools? Yeah, I'm not sure. 
that that would be the sort rather than try to go through JCPC and you know over the last ten years or whatever, I I, I would yeah. actually go to the I, Fort River School. I, I think there's actually a it's a challenge to get any kind of apples and apples because this you could say okay we're not going to build a new school we're going to put a new roof on them. Right. But some, you know, do that's the number that we would get from the you, you JCPC know, is the roof number. Put a whole right, new yeah. heating system in it. Put a, you know, whatever, because um, the, the Fort River modeling, on, you know, ninety percent renovation and ten percent new. If you had to build a school that was fifty percent larger, it's got to be more new. You know, some part of it has to be more new because it's bigger than the current school. But, you know, so that's where you get if you're really, trying to to fit it to a different purpose than they were just right. creating windows. In the and, and the reality is a lot of those projects that would be sort of the alternative to a new building, they're gonna be part of this process. They're not gonna be all done at once. They're gonna be go through the, the JCPC process and have to get vetted and approved each year. Dorothy. Um, it's some of the, I guess a meeting we had recently, and there, there was support for DPW, by the way. Um, People do have, have a sense of how, of how valuable it is. But there was some expressed worry about the stabilization fund. In your plan, does that stay strong? Yeah, so there's different ways to model it. We're trying to find at least a model that relies on the stabilization fund as little as possible so that in the future, if there's, because again, what this doesn't model is an economic downturn where, exactly, where state aid um, plummets or we have an issue. So we're really trying to come up with a model or options that we're not banking on using all of the stabilization fund to support because we'd rather that be there for if you for stabilization if there's an economic downturn. But Sean, can you scroll down to your box with the red? Because that's what you're doing in a sub... A yeah, sub it should be zero basically in this so case. So he's, he's allowing it to go above... It, it stays green or yellow if it goes above our levy as long as we're not drawing the stabilization down to zero. I mean, he's got some, you've got some. Yeah, so this is just the amount. This, so as of right now, the stabilization fund itself is not um, specifically included in here. But again, we, oh, you have that little box. yeah, we fact, if it's with 10 million over, again, that's just sort of my arbitrary number that I came up with, which is, I think we could make a, figure out a way to make it work if we were within that range. Um, if you're much over that range, then it starts being, in my opinion, more difficult to uh, figure out how to make that solution work. No, I, I think that's important, you know, to say we want at least five million, whatever the number is, and then yeah. you can draw it down, you can draw it down, but, you know, the, the red light comes on when, I'm sorry, you, there's, right. there's no more drawdown. Yeah, you have now. to draw, you have to come up with some number, or at least for the model, to kind of, yeah, you know, either way, there's a what, little margin of error on each side. In this, in this one here where you have everything going out for um, debt exclusion override and us spending this money on um, repairs for sidewalks, what multiplier or what level are you using? It's a lot of money for sidewalks. That's so, a lot of money for sidewalks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> sidewalks, roads, et cetera. Um, yeah. um, wait, I'm sorry, what multiple? You said multiplier? No, I can't read the number up um, there. So this is, this is kind of looking at if we spend the same rough level that we're currently spending, which is a little over $5 million. Okay. Um, yeah. But, excuse me, but we, we didn't spend over $5 million because we've got still one point whatever of debt service from old, Stuff so the, right. So in these early the new years, stuff has only been at least last year. Right, the new, new was stuff only about three and a half. Uh, new stuff is less, but as that winds down, so going yep. forward. But you're right. On this current year, new stuff was less than the five million. Yeah. Yep. And then I think only about two point five was roads and sidewalks, and the rest was equipment yep. and yep. technology. So could you just go down to the tax rate so we can just scare yeah, you're everybody? You're not going to see that. You sure? So this is if you excluded everything. So that's the amount that would be ex increased above the regular tax rate to pay for the debt exclusion override. It's not, it's not the tax that somebody would pay, the tax that somebody mm -hmm. would pay would be much higher. Right. That's the amount yeah. just created by debt exclusion. Yes. 
And what is the value you have up there for the uh, three hundred and twenty-two okay. thousand? You've got, you've got all the projects in there with the debt override? Um, I, yeah, I switched them all. So it's two of them go in 2023. So that first, the first bump up is a combination of the library and the schools. And then in 2027 is DPW, and then 2030 is Fire Station. Yeah. Can you talk that in words? I can't see the numbers anyway. Up there. Yeah, so again, I. This is just, we did the, I did this so that you could see the other chart, what it looks like with no projects in it. So it was more for that purpose. Um, but this just shows that if you excluded all the projects, you'd be adding um, at its peak about a little less than $1,200 on top of um, a, an average property value of 322000 on top of their property tax bill. We're not considering, We're not considering no. that. I, I mean, I don't think, I haven't heard I, anybody I have a problem that. with putting things like this anywhere because. Right. Somebody's going to run with it. All right. Um, so again, I'll send this to you all. Um, you can send me your feedback, impact, um, input, any other, you know, if you see anything. So you're going to send know. it to us? Yeah, I'll send it to you probably yeah, tomorrow I, morning. I, the only other choice, question I had, but I'll see it if you send it to us when you allowed a two school choice did mm -hmm. you do a paired choice you know so we we only need to build a school for you know x number of students it lets you choose so it lets you um it lets you choose based on you know how um how sort of involved i guess you've been you can choose for example 465 here and you can choose a 315 or um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, either down the road, there are a couple yeah. of different ways of doing it once you send it back yeah. to us. One is you could say, you know, if we're going to do two schools, we need either space for 750 kids or we need mm -hmm. space for 600 kids, depending right. on what you're doing in sixth grade. Yeah. So don't choose two schools that only yeah, accommodate 500 that. kids. You know, I mean, you have to, you know, it's a, you, you don't have free choice on right. what we're building. The hard um, part was there's just so many options. No, there's so many PSJP options. So just te tell the that. user that, yeah. you know, your constraints are this. Yeah, what the enrollment um, target should yeah. be for, yeah, that makes sense. Good. Any final questions? No, but I, Lynn, I, you know, I, I do think putting the yellow on the bottom would be good. Um, so if you put fire as the very top one, I just I just think it's a, conceptually that not before any of the buildings. If you want to do something, this is how much. It, it just it's hard for me to think that the remainder is everything else, as opposed to my except, options. Except but, for the fact that if you borrow money you got to pay it back. And this is the debt that we owe. And so putting um, the debt you owe at the bottom um, is actually because you don't have a choice. And therefore, the only thing that remains flexible is cutting back on the things that you allocate year for year. And that's why it makes sense to have it on top. Well, except that, notice, Green is going down here because he's ex he's making the taxpayers pay for all. You know, so you're not, we are paying for the debt, but we're not seeing it. In, I'm not making them pay. We're not right. seeing it on the draw on our five million. You know, somebody's paying Cut for that. that. You know what, Andy, I think you've just convinced me that I like it on top. Okay. <laughs> because that, that means now we have to go into stabilization to make to continue to put this other, and so it makes people look at the issue of what do you give up? Okay. But as we know, some people believe, and I'm not saying they're wrong, that roads and sidewalks are as, and vehicles are as important as these buildings. So maybe we leave it this way. Well, I think what some people might agree on is that the roads and sidewalks are not, um, being maintained oh, yeah. and and but, so right. yeah okay but it may mean that they have to under i think what andy's pointing out is once we commit to any one of these projects now we have a debt we have to pay 
the only place where we can not be paying a debt is that gold mm -hmm. bar. And works. it says, this is what you have to give up, which in fact is roads, si sidewalks, vehicles, et cetera. Well, I get, sorry, just to further that, I think, I think people already think that. So do you know what I mean? Like if people already are experiencing that their roads and sidewalks aren't being maintained, the fact that they're gonna to have to give up the fact that their roads and sidewalks aren't gonna be maintained is, you know. A well, I think it's gonna be, there are many people who believe the roads and sidewalks should be the fifth project, so. Some people would give up something else first. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, Andy's point works better when we didn't debt exclude everything else because the green bar was going up. <laughs> Now it's this magic. We built a whole bunch of buildings without any debt, and that's because it's over there on the, on the taxpayer. So you know, we just have to be careful when we're using this, because this, just like schools disappear, where well, we're spending on the schools, it's just showing up someplace else. Yep, no, that's gonna be one of the most important decisions you guys are gonna have to You've gotta really with. know what, what you're doing when you're playing with this model. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Just for the sake of discussion, you started out with this, the only debt exclusion was the schools. Mm -hmm. You put in the full library, um, you put in 20 for fire, you put in 25 for DPW. <coughs> and you backed the years, and you made the years earlier like, you know, around 224, two so forth. Maybe 224, 225. Yeah. Yep. So now the only thing that's out is schools. Schools, yeah, schools are the only ones that are in the, the schools exclusion. are down below. Which are at, um, 400, or a little over 400. Last question, and then I, we should let you go, and we should get, conclude our own meeting, too. Would it be helpful for people visualizing this to put the current total of stabilization above that red box so that people have something to measure it against? I mean, it's just a label insertion. It's doable. I just, from our perspective, I think the thing we're, we don't want to necessarily get to a place where the plan is to spend the whole stabilization fund to make this plan work, because then you're left with nothing. To, so I think it's just being careful with that comparison if people think you can spend all of it to make this work, because you're just, you're going to be at a much greater risk. That we should, I mean, the other way to approach it is to, in this probably is if, further finance committee and maybe even council policy discussion is what amount, what is the minimum amount of stabilization that we feel must be maintained and because uh, the current policy is, as Sonia pointed out earlier, as we, uh, the policy says reserves should be between five and 15 percent and anything about five percent can go in stabilization. That makes it sound like 5% is the minimum. If you're saying that 5% is not the minimum, yeah, which makes a logical right? statement to make, <laughs> yeah. then we, it ought to become a policy question. Then you say, though, that reserves right now are 19? Oops, 19.7%. But um, the 5% above free cash is what our policy says. Anything in free cash that is over 5% gets moved over to stabilization. 5% doesn't really have anything to do with the stabilization other than between 5 and 15% for reserves as a total. So the sum of free cash. But what we could do, you know, in terms of your box, Andy, is whatever the number is, you know, we've got 20 million, 15 million in the stabilization fund. We can say the stabilization fund has 
as much as 10 million available. Or, you know, so we've taken the 5 million out. Whatever, what, you know, it would require a decision that there's as much as 10 million available, and beyond that, we don't have, we don't have a savings account. It's like I have to keep some, so making that decision on looking at what our current reserves are, saying we don't want to go below a certain threshold, then you could show the net over that as is available to, it's we've been building up the savings account to use for this. Right. We just can't drain it. I'm gonna wear my comptroller hat here and remind everybody that at any point in time, we may not be able to ma maintain 10% of the tax levy. So we wanna keep enough in the stabilization fund to cover our debt once we obligate ourselves. That's what I mean. I mean, whatever, I mean, as Andy said, we don't know what the, have a considered number that we really need to have and we shouldn't go below that, whatever it is. It, it, it also shouldn't be too hard to go back and look over the years, over the two or three, four years in a row where we would have to use stabilization and figure out what that money would cost in today's money. I mean, that to me, that's much more of what we re really need to understand is when we've used stabilization in, in the past, how much have we had to use? I, I think, well, just talking about regular people, not <clears throat> mathematicians, that they would like to not have any of the stabilization used on the four projects, because if you do a project, you know that there's always extra money that, that has to come up, so that not only would there be a cushion against a downturn, which people right. think is coming, but there would be money there for the things that we didn't plan on that, that happened. Yeah. Yep. Saul, makes, Saul makes me go back in time, which I hate to do, because back around 2006 or seven, when we developed the policy with um, our former finance director, who at that time was John Musanti, 15% was a pipe dream. We were nowhere near 15%. Does that mean I have hopes for 25%? <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's, that's a policy question. We, we, we created this policy goal of 15% at that time, thinking maybe someday we'd get there. And Sonia's a big reason why you're there. So, I don't know what else to say on it. Is there other questions? Then I thank you very much. I know you of somebody who's very impatiently wanting you to get home. Do you have an understudy? She wanted to come to work today, so that's... Sean, do you have an understudy? Yeah, so her, um, her daycare was, or her school was closed today, so she's either at daycare all day or she wanted me to pick her up and shadow me for the day, so... She's very busy. Yeah. <laughs> Take my daughter <laughs> she, to work. She got her uh, technology time in. Well, thank you prayer. very much, Sean, for being here and being part of this and uh, uh, all of the work you've done on this project. Yeah, no it problem. has really been great and I think it's going to be very, very helpful as we're going into our next yeah. stage, and, which is what we wanted it for, as well as for our own thinking and analysis. Um, so I think we're going to do, let me just, just run, tell you where we are with the agenda because I don't think we can have to do anything else at this point. Um, we said that if anybody had any additional questions about the year and fourth quarter report, they could raise them again at the next building. The percent for arts, I just wanted to mention that um, most of what we're talking about in the current version, and Kathy will add to it as chair if, uh, if she thinks I'm really being too brief, but I'm trying to be brief, is that. Um, it's new buildings, and new buildings are funded one of two ways, which we've been talking about. And the chart, current, the chart currently has an amount um, available to calculate what you've debt excluded. And I think that what we probably need to do is figure out um, some way of demonstrating what the cost is for buildings that we're building that are not debt excluded, how much the annual additional increment will be on bond expenditures and uh, for payback, and we'll work with uh, Sonia on that. 
and uh, that will allow us, when the process gets further, to be able to contribute our piece of talking about cost, because we're going to be more about cost than policy probably at that point, even though um, Mary Lou feels a little bit more strongly on the topic. Um, but go ahead, Kathy. And so, then I'll, and I just I'll preview. We are, we're hoping to get a revised version back to finance a couple weeks from now, um, if or within that. But the two big changes we've made from the original to respond to concerns about the total cost is that it only applies to a project that's at least a million dollars. We raised the threshold that would be debt finance, so we're spreading the cost out, and then we put in. I called it uh, initially an escape clause. If the council and the manager determines right now we can't, we can decide not to by a majority vote. So it, it specifically allows a, on a project by project basis. And then the, the third piece is some people were worried that the art project development might slow down the implementation of the major project. So again, it can be canceled. <laughs> if it can't be done in a timely manner. You know, so we put some things in that are protective in terms of total total. So that's what Annie is saying. Then you can model it, saying if you're financing an art project over 20 years, it's in any given year, it's not a lot of money. So but that's what's going to be coming back in terms of some fairly substantial changes from uh, uh, create a fund and have to appropriate every year. So I will. Um work with Kathy, who's chair of the ad hoc committee, and uh, we'll see, talk to Sonia about any help we need for modeling the financial piece for percent for arts, and that will come back on a future agenda and be a more informed discussion that way. Um, the scheduling for next year's meetings will take up at a future meeting. And uh, so the only last thing is, uh, Lynn, did you have anything you wanted to um, say to the committee or ask the committee regarding the update on uh, in preparation for scheduling of the listening sessions on major projects? Right. So um, <clears throat> uh, some of us have been working very hard to get ready for uh, taking this out on the road. On November 18th at 5.30, we're going to do, um, for anybody who wants to attend, it's the hour before the town council actually meets, but it'll be an official meeting of the town council because there will probably be a, a majority. We're going to do a thing where we basically say, here's the, um, um, here's the PowerPoint and here's the script and here's how we're planning to approach these meetings, et cetera. We are not going to do the video at that point because we don't want to do a video and then have to go back and change it. So, but we're doing the video within like two days after that. And then I'll, we actually, and I'll send this, have Andy send this or you send this to you. We've actually set four dates for listening sessions. The first one is December 3rd which is um, both in the afternoon and then the evening, two different meetings. And then December, Monday, December 9th, again, two different meetings, one in the afternoon and one in the evening. And um, this is where we basically, and we invite you to come and join us, we basically sit there and say nothing, uh, but listen, like the schools did. And um, the schools and the library are also invited to come and do the same. Um, and the facilitator that is working with us is the same one that they used for the schools, although they have screened out a person that did not work that well because they were too familiar with Amherst. <laughs> so they kind of kept wanting to lead the audience. Um, and that doesn't work for us. So um, this is going along very well. Kathy's working with me on some of this. Um, and Andy and I have a big thing we need to do, but I wanted to just uh, alert you to that. The other thing let me just mention too is that there will be a formal invitation sent out for the December 2nd State of the Town uh, meeting. It'll be a meeting of, the, a special meeting of the council and it will be the town manager and myself have to do by charter a State of the Town address. And then also the library and the uh, schools are going to be doing uh, annual reports of their year as well. 
So what time does it start? That one starts at 6.30. Okay. And I should add, um, Senator Comerford and uh, Representative Dom will also be speaking about legislative initiatives, particularly as they relate to the municipal government. So, um, no public to comment. Is there anything else that anybody from the committee would like to report on or ask? And if not, um, I think for this meeting we uh, can be adjourned and I think I'll just declare it without the motion that we're adjourning at 4.50 and I want to thank Amherst Media for providing coverage because I do know from questions that I received that a lot of people appreciate Amherst Media doing this for us and I want to thank our note taker and uh, Sonia who's provided our support and um, we're adjourned. Thank you.